in sociology, anthropology and linguistics. Structuralism is the theory that elements of human culture must be understood in terms of their relationship to a larger, overarching system or structure. It works to uncover the structures that underlie all the things that humans do, think, perceive, and feel. Alternatively, as summarized by philosopher Simon Blackburn, Structuralism is the belief that phenomena of human life are not intelligible except through their interrelations. These relations constitute a structure, and behind local variations in the surface phenomena there are constant laws of abstract culture. Structuralism in Europe developed in the early 1900s, in the structural linguistics of Ferdinand de Sauscher and the subsequent Prague, Moscow and Copenhagen schools of linguistics. In the late 1950s and early 60s, when structural linguistics was facing serious challenges from the likes of Noam Chomsky and thus fading in importance, an array of scholars in the humanities borrowed Sauch's concepts for use in their respective fields of study. French anthropologist Claude L. E. Acute V. I. Strauss was arguably the first such scholar, sparking a widespread interest in structuralism. The structuralist mode of reasoning has been applied in a diverse range of fields, including anthropology, sociology, psychology, literary criticism, economics and architecture. The most prominent thinkers associated with structuralism include Elie Acute V. I. Strauss, linguist Roman Jakobson, and psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. As an intellectual movement, structuralism was initially presumed to be the heir apparent to existential Socialism. However, by the late 1960s, many of structuralism's basic tenets came under attack from a new wave of predominantly French intellectuals such as the philosopher and historian Michel Foucault, the philosopher and social commentator Jacques Derrida, the Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser, and the literary critic Roland Barthes. Though elements of their work necessarily relate to structuralism and are informed by it, these theorists have generally been referred to as post-structuralists. In the 1970s, structuralism was criticized for its rigidity in a historicism. Despite this, many of structuralism's proponents, such as Lacan, continue to assert an influence on continental philosophy and many of the fundamental assumptions of some of structuralism's post-structuralist. Critics are a continuation of structuralism. Overview The term structuralism is a belated term that describes a particular philosophical, literary movement or moment. The term appeared in the works of French anthropologist Claude L. E. Acute V. I. Strauss and gave rise, in France, to the structuralist movement, influencing the thinking of writers such as Louis Althusser, the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, as well as the structural Marxism of Nikos Polonces, most of whom disavowed themselves as being a part of this movement. The origins of structuralism connect with the work of Ferdinand de Sauscher on linguistics, along with the linguistics of the Prague and Moscow schools. In brief, de Sauscher's structural linguistics propounded three related concepts. De Sauscher argued for a distinction between lang and parole. He argued that the sign was composed of both a signified, an abstract concept or idea, and a signifier, the perceived sound, visual image. Because different languages have different words to describe the same objects or concepts, there is no intrinsic reason why a specific sign is used to express a given signifier. It is thus arbitrary. Signs thus gain their meaning from their relationships and contrasts with other signs. As he wrote, in language, there are only differences without positive terms. Proponents of structuralism would argue that a specific domain of culture may be understood by means of a structure modeled on language, that is, distinct both from the organizations of reality and those of ideas or the imagination, the third order. In Lacan's psychoanalytic theory, for example, the structural order of the symbolic is distinguished both from the real and the imaginary. Similarly, in Althusser's Marxist theory, 
The structural order of the capitalist mode of production is distinct both from the actual real agents involved in its relations and from the ideological forms in which those relations are understood. Blending Freud and de Sousa, the French structuralist Jacques Lacan applied structuralism to psychoanalysis and, in a different way, Jean Piaget applied structuralism to the study of psychology. But Jean Piaget, who would better define himself as constructivist, considers structuralism as a method not a doctrine, because for him there exists no structure without a construction, abstract or genetic. Although the French theorist Louis Althusser is often associated with a brand of structural social analysis which helped give rise to structural Marxism, such association was contested by Althusser himself in the Italian foreword to the second edition of Reading Capital. In this foreword Althusser states the following. Despite the precautions we took to distinguish ourselves from the structuralist ideology, Despite the decisive intervention of categories foreign to structuralism, the terminology we employed was too close in many respects to the structuralist terminology not to give rise to an ambiguity, with a very few exceptions. Our interpretation of Marx has generally been recognized and judged, in homage to the current fashion, as structuralist. We believe that despite the terminological ambiguity, the profound tendency of our texts was not attached to the structuralist ideology. In a later development, feminist theorist Alison Asita enumerated four ideas that she says are common to the various forms of structuralism. First, that a structure determines the position of each element of a whole. Second, that every system has a structure. Third, structural laws deal with coexistence rather than change. Fourth, structures are the real things that lie beneath the surface or the appearance of meaning. Structuralism in linguistics. In Ferdinand de Sauch's course in general linguistics, the analysis focuses not on the use of language, but rather on the underlying system of language. This approach examines how the elements of language relate to each other in the present, synchronically rather than diachronically. Sauscher argued that linguistic signs were composed of two parts, a signifier, a signified. This was quite different from previous approaches that focused on the relationship between words and the things in the world that they designate. Other key notions in structural linguistics include paradigm, syntam, and value. A structural idealism is a class of linguistic units that are possible in a certain position in a given linguistic environment, which is called the syntam. The different functional role of each of these members of the paradigm is called value. Sauch's course influenced many linguists between World War I and World War II. In the United States, for instance, Leonard Bloomfield developed his own version of structural linguistics, as did Louis Hjelmslev in Denmark and Alf Sommerfeldt in Norway. In France, Antoine Mait and Emile Benveniste continued Sauch's project. Most importantly, however, members of the Prague School of Linguistics such as Roman Jakobsen and Nikolai Trubetskoy conducted research that would be greatly influential. However, by the 1950s Sauch's linguistic concepts were under heavy criticism and were soon largely abandoned by practicing linguists. Sauscher's views are not held, so far as I know, by modern linguists, only by literary critics and the occasional philosopher. Strict adherence to Sauscher has elicited wrong film and literary theory on a grand scale. One can find dozens of books of literary theory bogged down in signifiers and signifieds but only a handful that refer to Chomsky. The clearest and most important example of Prague school structuralism lies in phonemics. Rather than simply compiling a list of which sounds occur in a language, the Prague school sought to examine how they were related. They determined that the inventory of sounds in a language could be analyzed in terms of a series of contrasts. Thus, in English, the sounds P and B represent distinct phonemes because there are cases where the contrast between the two is the only difference between two distinct words.
Analyzing sounds in terms of contrastive features also opens up comparative scope. It makes clear, for instance, that the difficulty Japanese speakers have differentiating R and L in English is because these sounds are not contrastive in Japanese. Phonology would become the paradigmatic basis for structuralism in a number of different fields. Structuralism in anthropology According to structural theory in anthropology and social anthropology, meaning is produced and reproduced within a culture or through various practices, phenomena and activities that serve as systems of signification. A structuralist approach may study activities as diverse as food preparation and serving rituals, religious rites, games, literary and non-literary texts and other forms of entertainment to discover the deep structures by which meaning is produced and reproduced within the culture. For example, Elia Cute V. I. Strauss analyzed in the 1950s cultural phenomena including mythology, kinship, and food preparation. In addition to these studies, he produced more linguistically focused writings in which he applied Sauch's distinction between Lang and Parole in his search for the fundamental structures of the human mind, arguing that the structures that form the deep grammar of society originate in the mind and operate in people unconsciously. Elia Cute V. I. Strauss took inspiration from mathematics. Another concept used in structural anthropology came from the Prague School of Linguistics where Roman Jakobson and others analyzed sounds based on the presence or absence of certain features. Elia Cute V. I. Strauss included this in his conceptualization of the universal structures of the mind, which he held to operate based on pairs of binary oppositions such as hot-cold, male-female, culture-nature, cook-draw, or marriageable versus tabooed women. A third influence came from Marcel Mauss, who had written on gift exchange systems. Based on Mauss, for instance, Elia Cute V. I. Strauss argued that kinship systems are based on the exchange of women between groups as opposed to the descent-based theory described by Edward Evans, Pritchard and Mayo Fortes. While replacing Marcel Mauss at his École Pratique des Hautes Études chair, Elia Cute V. I. Strauss' writing became widely popular in the 1960s and 1970s and gave rise to the term structuralism itself. In Britain, authors such as Rodney Needham and Edmund Leach were highly influenced by structuralism. Authors such as Morris Godelier and Emmanuel Thérèse combined Marxism with structural anthropology in France. In the United States, authors such as Marshall Salins and James Boone built on structuralism to provide their own analysis of human society. Structural anthropology fell out of favor in the early 1980s for a number of reasons. Dandrade suggests that this was because it made unverifiable assumptions about the universal structures of the human mind. Authors such as Eric Wolf argued that political economy and colonialism should be at the forefront of anthropology. More generally, criticisms of structuralism by Pierre Bourdieu led to a concern with how cultural and social structures were changed by human agency and practice, a trend which Sherry Ortner has referred to as practice theory. Some anthropological theorists, however, while finding considerable fault with Elia Cute V. I. Strauss's version of structuralism, did not turn away from a fundamental structural basis for human culture. The biogenetic structuralism group, for instance, argued that some kind of structural foundation for culture must exist because all humans inherit the same system of brain structures. They proposed a kind of neuroanthropology which would lay the foundations for a more complete scientific account of cultural similarity and variation. By requiring an integration of cultural anthropology and neuroscience, a program that theorists such as Victor Turner also embraced, Structuralism in Literary Theory and Criticism In literary theory, structuralist criticism relates literary texts to a larger structure, which may be a particular genre, a range of intertextual connections, a model of a universal narrative structure, or a system of recurrent patterns or motifs. 
Structuralism argues that there must be a structure in every text, which explains why it is easier for experienced readers than for non-experienced readers to interpret a text. Hence, everything that is written seems to be governed by specific rules, or a grammar of literature, that one learns in educational institutions and that are to be unmasked. A potential problem of structuralist interpretation is that it can be highly reductive, as scholar Catherine Belsey puts it. The structuralist danger of collapsing all difference. An example of such a reading might be if a student concludes the authors of West Side Story did not write anything, really, new, because their work has the same structure as Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. In both texts a girl and a boy fall in love despite the fact that they belong to two groups that hate each other and conflict is resolved by their death. Structuralist readings focus on how the structures of the single text resolve inherent narrative tensions. If a structuralist reading focuses on multiple texts, there must be some way in which those texts unify themselves into a coherent system. The versatility of structuralism is such that a literary critic could make the same claim about a story of two friendly families that arrange a marriage between the children despite the fact that the children hate each other and then the children commit suicide to escape the arranged marriage. The justification is that the second story's structure is an inversion of the first story's structure. The relationship between the values of love and the two pairs of parties involved have been reversed. Structuralistic literary criticism argues that the literary banter of a text can lie only in new structure, rather than in the specifics of character development and voice in which that structure is expressed. Literary structuralism often follows the lead of Vladimir Propp, Al Gerdes, Julian Grimas and Claude L. E. Acute V. I. Strauss in seeking out basic deep elements in stories, myths, and more recently, anecdotes, which are combined in various ways to produce the many versions of the Ur story or a myth. There is considerable similarity between structural literary theory and Northrop Frye's archetypal criticism, which is also indebted to the anthropological study of myths. Some critics have also tried to apply the theory to individual works, but the effort to find unique structures in individual literary works runs counter to the structuralist program and has an affinity with new criticism, history and background. Throughout the 1940s and 1950s, existentialism, such as that propounded by Jean-Paul Sartre, was the dominant European intellectual movement. Structuralism rose to prominence in France in the wake of existentialism, particularly in the 1960s. The initial popularity of structuralism in France led to its spread across the globe. Structuralism rejected the concept of human freedom and choice and focused instead on the way that human experience and thus behavior is determined by various structures. The most important initial work on this score was Claude L. E. Acute V. I. Strauss's 1949 volume The Elementary Structures of Kinship. L. E. Acute V. I. Strauss had known Jacobson during their time together at the New School in New York during World War II and was influenced by both Jacobson's structuralism as well as the American anthropological tradition. In Elementary Structures he examined kinship systems from a structural point of view and demonstrated how apparently different social organizations were in fact different permutations of a few basic kinship structures. In the late 1950s he published Structural Anthropology, a collection of essays outlining his program for structuralism. By the early 1960s structuralism as a movement was coming into its own and some believed that it offered a single unified approach to human life that would embrace all disciplines. Roland Barthes and Jacques Derrida focused on how structuralism could be applied to literature. The so-called Gang of Four of Structuralism was Elie Acute V.I. Strauss, Lacan, Barthes, and Foucault. 